Okay, so you know what I'm, I'm going to try to do is just take a few minutes, and maybe we'll have a, a couple questions um, uh, on the situation. But let me let me uh, start by saying I think one thing we have to put in the middle of this is, and it's some in some ways um, it gets expressed, but not, and. Uh, and that is a certain quality of necessity. And let me let me say, uh, Mr. Volz brought this up. We we're in a situation where Nawapa, prop, as, as, and I'm going to give it a little additional aspect, is not an an option. And when we have, we have to have Nawapa. We have to have not only Nawapa but something bigger than Nawapa. It's going to start with Nawapa. Uh, one way to look at this is probably the single biggest physical crisis in the world today is water. Water is life. People don't have water, they die. You destroy water infrastructure, you die. We see this in Haiti, for example. They, we have, we have a, a, an absolute disaster which the President of the United States ignored when Lyndon LaRouche called for the United States to take responsibility for 10 million Haitians. And we're, all, we're, we're their nearest ally, we're, we're, we can deal with them as a sovereign nation state. And Obama pulled the military out when LaRouche called for the Army Corps of Engineers and the military to go in. They have no water infrastructure, they have no roads. So we now have a cholera epidemic. You can take that as a harbinger of things to come because we have a massive breakdown of infrastructure. We have water shortages in the state of California, which has uh, suffered a $60 billion cut in budgets over the last few years. The American population is going to have to deal with something. People voted because they hated Obama, and they got a bunch of uh, Republicans who are about to go in and kill people. People in California hated Schwarzenegger, and so they voted in Jerry Brown, who hired Schwarzenegger's budget director. <laughs> so they get it. you can't vote your hatreds. You have to you have to change the policy. And you have to recognize what you're up against. The entire existing monetary system, which is a largely London-based Venetian monetary system centered in the Inter-Alpha Banking Group, Royal Bank of Scotland, but really it's, it's the long-standing British financial empire that goes back to the British East Indies Company against which we fought a revolution, against that kind of monetary system. We've lost that. And anybody who stands, that, that monetary system, as LaRouche said on July 25th, 2007, died. It's really a dead system. The Irish may put it in its grave. They've given that up. A small country has been given that opportunity because the entire system is dead. And the only thing the the, uh, the financial system can do to live is not really live, is it can destroy nations and populations, including the United States. We're in a situation where, as a functional sovereign nation state. The United States could be lost in the days and weeks ahead, particularly if we get these lunatics like Alan Simpson and Bowles and the Cat Food Commission under the direction of Obama and the present Republican incoming Congress. You will destroy the United States in very short order because they're talking about hundreds of billions in cuts, entitlements, Medicare, Social Security. And the truth is anybody who fights these people has to recognize they're facing the, the empire, a financial empire, a Venetian empire, not an empire of colonies, but an empire that runs through running the monetary system. Because if you control the monetary system as a system based on his fictitious, historic money values, you devalue human beings. What, we're real, what this is really about is two views of human nature. Human beings are simply creatures of pleasure and pain a la Adam Smith, John Locke, Jeremy Bentham, 
and you're not allowed to think. Think about how they think about the market. You can, if you intervene in the market, you're doing something evil because you're asserting human uh, activity in the laws of the market, which are the laws of the universe. You should be an animal and act on your pleasures and your pains. Side with your tribe against another tribe. Now that system is dying, it's dead, but it wishes to destroy human beings in the process. The other view of humanity is embodied, at, at, at least in political history. I would say it's embodied best in the, working, in the writings of Lyndon LaRouche in the contemporary period. Its historic root is the unique quality of the American Constitution, the federal Constitution, not, not, the, not the Confederacy of the United States, not the Articles of Confederation, but the federal Constitution and most especially the preamble. You know, I, I'll give you a funny side story and then I want to get to a, a main point in this. Uh, there's a guy from one of these neocon or federalist uh, groupings, these people who hate the United States and hate humanity, a guy named Thomas DiLorenzo. And he was on interviewed, I think, on one of these talk shows recently. And he said, look, there's no such thing as the union. The, the union is never mentioned in the Constitution. Now, of course, the union was, the, it was Ben Franklin, Alexander Hamilton, John Quincy Adams, their whole idea was the states don't exist unless the union exists. But, so you say to a guy like Di Lorenzo, what about the, uh, we the people of the, uh, of the United States in order to form a more perfect union? It's the first sentence in the Constitution. <laughs> so these, so what, what their answer is, well, that's not really part of the Constitution. These guys are Talmudists. It's not the Constitution. That's the preamble to the Constitution. It's not an official part of the Constitution. Yet every time this country has had to be saved against the Articles of Confederation, which were what? They were a British effort to recapture the colonies based on free trade. The Confederacy, which has an explicit statement against infrastructure. Feder the funds of the Confederacy cannot be used to finance the infrastructural development of the Confederate States. Lincoln defeated the British, not the Confederacy. Roosevelt told Winston Churchill, who had to crawl on his hands and knees to the White House to get the backing of the United States against the monster that the British Empire created in fascism and Hitler on the European continent in the 1920s and 30s. And Roosevelt said, only if the colonies are ended, only if India is given its independence. And Churchill almost had a heart attack. Now that's the kind of opposite. We, the, the American Constitution is based on the idea that the nation state exists to promote the creative powers of the individual members of the society to be able to contribute to what? To our posterity. Not to our own security alone. To our future. To the future generations of this nation which exists as a leading impulse for other nations and their sovereignty. Anybody who goes against this, Kennedy was assassinated. Why? Because he opposed the Indochina War. He took the steel barons on. He followed MacArthur and Eisenhower's advice. And they couldn't stop him. McKinley, the last president of the United States to be a serving veteran in the Civil War. Lincoln. Now, I, I, I want to invite people here to make the point to go to the website. Even Freddie should go to the website. Okay. Um, to go to the website, and there's an. Uh, he can take it, he's a tough guy. The, uh, uh, it, uh, to go to the website and read a release. I forget the, it's a, something, it has the word Wurlitzer in the title, so you'll find it easily. Uh, which goes through a legal action brought against Lyndon LaRouche uh, by a, a woman named Molly Cronberg. But th that documents the fact that this is a case that is being run along with another case in Great Britain itself by the British against Lynn. They have hated Lyndon LaRouche 
and it's come to this. Their view, this is not a legal case. This is political persecution. And, and whenever somebody like Lynn comes along, who's prepared to unveil the monster behind the, the, the curtain, who says, no, it's the, it's the Venetian Empire. It's the people who run the banking system, the financial system, the currencies. And of course, the whole thing is, I won't even go into the whole thing's a whole fraud. But anyone who stands against it, as Lynn has, without any qualification, becomes a target of this imperial force. And so you can say that increasingly since July 25, 2007, this is a battle between what Lynn represents and what something like Nawapa is part of. And the Adam Smith, Jeremy Bentham utilitarian philosophy that controls people for an empire and that will kill people. That is fascism. Utilitarianism is fascism. What, it, what was the big fight over Obamacare that Lynn put forward? That this was a T4 policy, this was the policy of Hitler in September and October of 1939. If you don't add up to being, if the value of your life doesn't add up to the cost of your medical care, then we let you die. That's called rationalization in, in the healthcare area. That's what they're covering up. And so that's, that's the war that we're in now. Because this system is dead. The Oro is dead. The entire financial system is dead. The question is, will they impose, destroy nation states and impose fascism, or will something like what we're beginning to discuss here and understand the depth of the concept, will that be done? And that's, that's where the question of whether you do go out and organize other people, that's where it's all going to come from. Because we've got a sad situation at one level. We have a, a, lunatic, a, a president who really is simply not just, he, he doesn't have an insight to him. He's looking for a certain amount of acclaim. He's angry when he doesn't get it. And he has nothing except he believes that following British economic policy, which he, he is, is every one of his advisors, will get him the acclaim that he wants. We have a Congress that was a bunch of cowards under the Democratic Party and is going to probably be worse under this incoming group who believe that their great message in life is to destroy the government, <laughs> to destroy that which holds the union together if we're to have a union. This idea against big government just gets a little crazy. Do you think the states would have fought and won the war against Hitler? Which combination of states would you have gone to to fight Hitler? How would you have organized U.S. industry? How would you have controlled the flow of resources? You think you would have gone through every governor? <laughs> and if you found one sympathetic to Hitler, you were going to surrender? That's the kind of situation we actually have. Now, you look at, you, you look at what just came out this week. And, you know, I find myself a little stunned at, first of all, the fact that there's not real upset in the American population. And when there is, there's a tendency to direct it against our, next, uh, against our neighbors. You know, the, uh, uh, NIMBY is part of it. What about NIMBY about, you know, uh, the Mexican immigration question? There are problems. I'm not going to cover them over. But do you really think that the Mexican immigration problem is the cause of all our problems? If you do, your sense of proportion is completely out of whack. <laughs> I'll tell you how I can prove it. This week, the Federal Reserve because there was an, in, a, a, an interesting little amendment to the um, Dodd-Frank bill, which was a piece of garbage. I won't use nasty language. A piece of nothing, a sellout to Wall Street. But Sanders from Vermont managed to get a little thing in there, which nobody even noticed, which said they have to make their transactions public sometime after, I don't know how long the period was. But anyway, this Wednesday, the Federal Reserve had to put out what they did with the bailout. And of course, this has nothing to do with the TARP, 700, that's nothing, that's a drop in the bucket. That's for the Mickeys to pay attention to. The Federal Reserve at various facilities, a temporary loan facility, buying uh, repurchases, uh, buying bonds, in 21,000 transactions, spent 16 to 17 trillion dollars. So when I say 700 billion, 
ain't much. You know, it's, what is that, about 4%? 16 to 17 trillion, much of which, perhaps more than half of which, and really, if you have traced the whole thing, I'll give you an example, went to inter-alpha group and foreign banks. We bailed out Royal Bank of Scotland. We bailed out Societe General. We bailed out Santander. We bailed out Deutsche Bank. And I'm talking 300 billion right. each. I think it was Santander and Royal Bank of Switzerland, or one combination of those two. One particular facility, some people don't get this British thing at all. One particular facility, I think it was the temporary loan facility, gave out $3.3 trillion. $1.5 trillion went to British banks. That's the reality of this insane, sick financial system. Then they'll come back and say, you've got to cut education, you've got to cut health care, you've got to cut Medicare, you've got to cut Social Security, no infrastructure, nothing. Because to them, human beings in the main, as going back to the Greek period, as in Aeschylus, as in the story of Prometheus, mankind cannot have fire. What does that mean today? Mankind cannot have nuclear technology. Mankind cannot have science. Mankind cannot discover the principles of the universe. The, the use of the, the efforts of human beings to do that is a danger. To what? To the ruling powers. To the financial power. Now, the, the United States was built in a battle against that. Franklin went to England. He tried to negotiate with them. He tried to negotiate with the monarchy. He tried to negotiate with the parliament. And indeed, the biggest problem was the aristocracy. And they, they said, no, the colonies cannot become industrial powers. They ca cannot become scientific centers. Your job is to produce the raw materials that we may manufacture or find cheap labor to manufacture. You cannot grow. And ultimately, Franklin said, they will never let us develop. And we can only develop as a unified set of 13 colonies. And we fought a revolution against that power, against the power that killed millions in India, in Africa. We fought another, the second phase of that revolution in the Civil War, when the British supported the Confederacy along with the Habsburgs. And Lincoln rallied the country against Wall Street. Remember, Lincoln went to Wall Street and said, give us the money to fight the Civil War. And they said no. And Lincoln cr created the greenback, a federal currency, which didn't exist at the time. Imagine that. Roosevelt fought Wall Street. That's why we want Glass-Steagall exactly the way Roosevelt did it. Because Glass-Steagall reflects a principle of the U.S. Constitution. That the, the United States as a nation has sovereignty over the issuance of its currency, and its currency is issued on the basis of credit, which means the institution of future growth based on large-scale infrastructure and development projects. In effect, the, the federal government creates a debt to the future. And that's our credit. And we are a credit system as Hamilton developed it. Glass-Steagall is an expression of that credit system. We do not allow private central banking monetarist values to control the future destiny, the future projects, or the, the currency value of the sovereign currency of the United States. And we offer that policy to every other country willing to work with us. So we will go when we implement Glass-Steagall and uh, uh, clean up the states and so forth. You know, we have to issue grants to the states. They're all broke. And they can't go into debt. So we're going to have to give, as Roosevelt did, grants that are part of the growth policy, the credit policy of the United States. And then we have to implement large-scale projects that begin now. 
that revitalize, on the one hand, American industry, American labor, and goes to other nations and says we can set up a fixed exchange rate credit system based on joint projects of this type, like the Bering Strait project, the Eurasian land bridge. And so in effect, we do with the nation states that exist today, that are all bankrupt, what Hamilton did with the bankrupt states under the Articles of Confederation. Only now we have to make these treaties among sovereign nations. But let me tell you, some of those states saw themselves as separate nations at the time. Now, there's another element to this which is unique to LaRouche. Because what Lynn has done with the Nawapa project, and yes, it's true, it was built in, it was designed in 1964. And it did reflect something good, which I'll, I want to mention. But this is what, what Lynn's view of it is, is that this is not simply an infrastructure project. We're going to upgrade it, not just in detail, but what we want to do is take the most advanced science of the day. Because that's what infrastructure really represents. It represents taking the universal, the principles of science that are available to us today and applying them to the entire nation state and whatever allies we have. To, in effect, take a universal process, a nationwide process that encompasses the most advanced science and lift the entire population to a standard of living and opportunity to absorb the frontiers of science. And that prepares that culture for the next level of scientific development. Because any science takes you to the limits of your knowledge. And you experiment in nature. And you generate things that tell you that you don't know everything about the world. You might even have to use senses that you never knew you had before, but that's another story. That's something that we're, that's being worked on in the basement. How do you, does the human sensorium actually work? How broad really is it? What do we really sense? But the model for that is when you engage in scientific development, you inevitably uh, create circumstances that your science no longer is able to deal with. The subnuclear, the galactic and the intergalactic, the astronomical. And that challenges you to increase your knowledge of the principles of the universe. So science advances. And we want to do this self-consciously. So Nawapa is meant to take mankind to the extremes of our capabilities, but we need it to support the population. So it's not just a, a, an adventure. How are we going to get water to the world's population? How are we going to get food? How are we going to increase the skill level? And the way you increase the skill level is you challenge the intellect of the entire population. And you'll find they can do a lot of things quicker and faster. I mean, the model is World War II. We took a bunch of people who were demoralized, unemployed, semi-educated, and by the beginning of the war, we had them doing machine tool work. We had 17 million people under arms in the course of the entire war. We had people in factories building airplanes at a rate that no one could predict. The rate of attrition of technology was unbelievable. We went from 200 miles an hour to supersonic in three and a half years. We created the atomic energy capability during the war, the Manhattan Project. The whole, almost the, the entire beginning of what we know as computers today began with simulating aircraft to train pilots. By the end of the war, we were turning out pilots like nobody in the world could turn them out. In the beginning, we didn't have anything. So mission orientation is more than a word. But what Lynn is talking about is the necessity to increase the entire cultural level through the, uh, the implementation of the most advanced infrastructure projects available to us. One of the things we'll be doing is intersecting the Arctic and a great deal about the extremes of life and our relationship to the solar system is exemplified by the anomalies of the Arctic. The Arctic, uh, both poles, are the center of the uh, Earth's geomagnetic field. It's the strongest point of intersection with the solar wind. And it's a beginning insight into the way in which the cosmic 
development, or what Lynn calls cosmic radiation, is something that's, part, that's active throughout every part of the solar system and our relationship to the universe as a whole. So we begin to investigate things we never investigated before. And then you realize something. And this is something I think is very important for why the empire, the imperial monetary forces, Wall Street in London, Wall Street we don't need. You know, some things that you gotta, you gotta say that shock people. Why are our American citizens so committed to this anti-American system? They just, there was something called the American system. And the British fought it. World War I was to destroy the American system spread into Germany, into Japan, uh, in the latter part of the 19th century, into China. Part of the optimism of China is they're carrying out the mission of Sun Yat-sen, who is tra trained in the American system. Lincoln won the American system. And so in the last two-thirds of the 19th century, the last third of the 19th century, Germany under Bismarck, the Magi, Sun Yat-sen a generation later, the Russians under Mendeleev and Vita and Vernadsky were adopting the American system of internal development so that the land-based elements of the world, the population elements of the world, would be able to determine their own progress without dependency on the monetarist forces that control maritime trade. And this goes back a long time. They hate the American system. And what is it? Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, which is liveness defines it as wisdom. And that's where we got the definition from. And for our posterity, as in the preamble. And I'll tell you it's something I've repeated many times, because people don't understand how this is truly rooted. Uh, Roosevelt was not a pragmatist. Hamilton was not a pragmatist. They didn't stumble on these things. They were geniuses. And these were the ideas that they intended to implement. So uh, Roosevelt, in the second volume of his public papers, on page, I think it's four or five, says the definition of the New Deal. What was the New Deal? People will tell you it was socialism. What was the New Deal? And he says the New Deal is the preamble to the Constitution. And then he quotes the preamble of the Constitution. That's what the New Deal was. Not this other baloney. And what, what is it? What, is, what was Lincoln looking at? What was Quincy Adams looking at? What did Franklin want? What did Roosevelt talk about? The future. The younger generation. What we're about is what we leave behind for the future. Your identity as a human being goes even beyond your biological relationship to your own children. That's a good example of it. But human beings, when they're thinking, want to do something that is a positive impact for the further development of the human species generations into the future. You live in the moment, but you live for the future. You live in the moment, but in a sense you live for all time, including those who went before us, whose lives we give significance to by carrying their intention through us into future generations. That's why the, the, the preamble says, and our posterity. Human beings have a characteristic that's unique to human beings, that Lynn has emphasized, that sits at the core of human culture. It's why we need classical culture because we have to be able to express that sense of human creative identity that discovers the principles of the universe in a form that's available to you in the, in the moment, in classical art. So you can use that passion about creativity to create something that lives well beyond your mortal life. And you know that while you're alive. Every, no animal creates a scientific principle. There is creativity in evolutionary development, but no individual animal discovers a principle and implements it to change the behavior of the species, to change its relationship to the universe. We do that. And it's amazing that we're willing to give that up for a short-term pleasure or pain, or avoidance of pain, or some people, I guess, want pain, I don't know. Okay. For some people, pain is their pleasure. But we won't go there. Anyway, <laughs> and the WAPA, 
it, in a sense, the passion to actually get your WAPA done comes from understanding its unique role. We have to take the presently existing system that weighs like a, a, a ton of rock, a parasite, on not just us, but Africa, Asia, Haiti. We have to take that, that mission we have to take that rot off of our back. That's our mission. We have to implement Glass-Steagall. And we have to do it now. And that's really, I think, what we need to bring a little bit together on this Nawapa question. Because it's not just a nice idea. This is really the only pathway to the future of humanity and to being able to communicate what that idea means. And it is understanding the way Lyndon LaRouche understands it. And then you see why you hear, you know, why he's is proud of being attacked by the British. Okay, I don't think I went too. All right. So this should this should uh, conclude the these these proceedings this new office seminar. Um, but hopefully people have a, a better idea of a political commitment and a social commitment from layers of our society that have a sense that not only is this project feasible, but uh, it's necessary. And to do that, it's going to require your political commitment. So back up this pack, contribute, organize, communicate these ideas, research what Lyndon LaRouche is putting forward in his papers. Take this project and these ideas seriously because civilization does depend upon them. And uh, uh, again, thank you all for coming. We appreciate it. And uh, let's get to work. <laughs> <laughs>